Hello and welcome to our webinar. Uh, you're just joining us. Uh, it is on, we are very happy to have Dr. Tolley back with us um, today and he is going to answer some more questions for you um, about your bird's health. And while we wait for people to log on, let's try another poll question. Let's see how this goes today. Um, let's see, I am trying to find, ah, well, it looks like my poll question for today, I'm just gonna re-repost what I had last month because that was kind of fun. Um, and this will give time people to log on and we'll just do this one for now. And I'll give you time to do that. Which best describes your bird at the vet? Uh, my bird loves the personal attention. My bird tolerates personal attention. My bird has to be extracted from the travel carrier and have the tail ready because my bird is ready to rumble. Let's see how that is going. Looks like a uh, bird likes the personal attention. Well, that is awesome. Although we do have a lot that um, I uh, have the towel ready. My bird is ready. I have the towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble. That is also uh, popping up pretty high there. So Dr. Tolley, which birds do you think would love the personal attention at the vet? Is there a species specific one you can think of? <laughs> that would love the personal attention. Well, I, I would have to say that in general, you would have uh, all of the birds would love the, uh, the personal attention um, uh, that are, are receive it at the house um, and that aren't necessarily breeding. Uh, birds uh, because uh, they don't want the personal attention from me they want it from their mate right but uh, I would have to say in general the cockatoos would have to take this uh, that would love all of the personal attention that you could give and want more and so that that's what I would uh, have to say in my my experience if you want to pick one particular group of parrots uh, in general but uh, I've seen the ducks uh, that, that would love it and, uh, <laughs> you know, the chickens and, and then also all of everything from the, uh, the parallettes all on up. But, um, nice. but there are some that I can tell you that uh, don't want the personal attention from me. They want it from, from their mate. So we'll <laughs> that. all right. Hey, for the, those who are logging on, um, what, if you can, uh, submit your question with the Q&A. Um, that way we can have it listed. And uh, don't use the chat feature, but the Q&A feature, because if you do the Q&A feature and for some reason we don't get to your question today, then we can email you um, your question with an answer uh, later on. So, um, well, it looks like for the poll question, uh, we got a lot that are my bird tolerates the personal attention. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, and have the towel ready, you know, that might be during certain times of the year, especially, I mean, would, would, could that possibly be linked to like hormonal behavior or is it just the bird in general is just like, not like in the, the new environment? Do you know? I, I think that that would probably be the, the new environment and just the, the unusual of uh, maybe not being uh, used to a carrier or being transported into a, uh, an unusual environment for it, a comfortable environment. Um, and, and so the birds, in a sense, become comfortable within their environment, just like we do. And if they're taking out of that, and nobody really asks them. It's like, hey, I was fine in, in my cage, but it's, um, it, it's when you have to go to the doctor, just like we have to go to the physician, that, uh, that you have to do that. And, and for the most part, I can tell you, uh, over 34 years of uh, treating these, uh, these animals, uh, that uh, they, they uh, can tolerate it well. And if they have to, uh, because they're ill, the good outweighs the bad, uh, they have to be treated. And um, so for the most part, they may not like it psychologically and we have gone through and we have advanced our ability to reduce the stress as much as possible. 
uh, with the birds uh, and, and, and having a knowledge of when to handle them and when not to handle them is, is, is very, and how much we can do to treat them is extremely important so that we can have them continue to recover if they're ill and then treat them some more uh, on that. So um, it's, it's uh, in with sedation uh, at this point where we don't have to anesthetize for every procedure. The sedation is very helpful also to reduce the stress and some of the sedatives that we give the birds uh, <clears throat> seems to have and at least uh, there's a thought that there is some, some amnesia effect uh, with this where they don't necessarily remember what the, uh, the procedure uh, is, but the birds are not under total anesthesia, but they're sedated. So this is also uh, advancements that we've uh, had with uh, uh, medicine over the years that make it a, a better experience uh, for the bird and and the owner. Kind of sounds like going to the dentist. It seems to get more advanced and less painful right. and successful for us. So, um, so our poll results we have. Um, let's see. I'm going to end the poll, and here we go. Okay, so we have my bird loves the personal attention at nine percent. Uh, my bird tolerates the personal attention at forty-one percent. And my bird has to be extracted from the travel carrier at 14% and have the towel ready because my bird is ready to rumble at 36%. Let me share that. There we go. Well, that was interesting. Um, all right, hopefully we've had, uh, gave some more time for people to log in. Um, we're gonna start with some questions. Uh, just, uh, if you're just joining us, you, um, Welcome to the webinar on Ask the, uh, Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. He is a professor of veterinary clinical um, sciences department, the uh, section chief at the Bird Zoo and Exotic Animal Service at Louisiana State University School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot of uh, certification, that's a lot of um, certification. Word, it's a lot of words. Uh, it's a lot of words. <laughs> And yeah. have to, yes, and so that's why you go LSU, SVM. <laughs> you just, yeah, uh, All right, make LSU, it, make it easier. Um, okay, so we're gonna. Uh, be, uh, do you want to dive right into questions or? Well, you, and uh, that that would be uh, that would be great. I always want to to thank you, Laura, for uh, actually uh, being the moderator for this session. Uh, that's fantastic. It makes it it's so much easier. Uh, for the attendees and me, uh, also Brenda and uh, the Lefebvre Company for providing this, this uh, venue uh, for uh, pet bird owners to become more knowledgeable and uh, also find out a little bit more about the ones that they uh, love. Now, uh, one, I did want to mention, because we had mentioned the sedatives and the advancements in, in veterinary medicine, uh, to make the experience better and also to provide information as far as treatments and also diagnostic capabilities uh, to, to help identify diseases and also, as I mentioned, treat diseases uh, and, and, and illnesses that will help the birds live long, happy, healthy lives. And we've come so far in, in the, the number of years that I've been practicing, and I wanted to make sure that uh, the, the attendees are aware that a lot of the, the advances that we've uh, achieved have been through uh, the pet bird community, the pet bird owners, and through, through a number of local uh, bird clubs uh, that have contributed, um, and I have had a, a number contributed uh, contribute to to our uh, advancements in in medicine here at LSU. Uh, one in particular is the uh, the South Alabama Cage Bird Society, and they have uh, for many years uh, have provided, and and I know that there have been many, uh, and they're still uh, in communities that. Uh, provide education uh, and, and, and knowledge of the local birding community. And I would, I would say that if you 
are interested, you should look at some of these uh, local bird clubs to learn more uh, about the, uh, the birds that you have and also to have a knowledge base that you can call on somebody um, that's, that's a, you may not have a veterinarian in the, well, who, who treats birds? Who, who would you take your bird to? Uh, also just basic nutrition, education, and like I said, you know, contributions to advancing avian medicine. So you're part of the bigger picture that helps and you get a return on this. And I can tell you that, uh, through the years that I've had uh, uh, many uh, of the, uh, the local bird clubs have, have friendships that develop that are, are like no other. And then also on a bigger picture is the American Federation of Aviculture. Uh, that is, uh, you, you can learn a little bit more about the, the general avian uh, community and some of the research and this goes into some of the the native if you want to say well what what's going on maybe in in re, you know the reproduction in certain rare species and what's happening there uh, so I would uh, encourage anybody that has birds to look at their local community and and possibly uh, look at joining or becoming a, a member of the local bird clubs Oh, that's great advice. Um, those are those are great organizations, and yeah, it also will help um, potentially fund uh, new medicines and new techniques for veterinary medicine. So thank you for that shout out. Those are very important uh, places to go for bird information. Um, well, let's get started with some of these questions that we have from our audience. Um, I have CC um, with a question that says, "I have a bird who has had E. coli two times. My vet says no sprouts." Um, but that's, that's her favorite food. She says, tough love. I say she has to, I say there has to be a way to cook and serve. So how long do lentils and chickpeas need to be boiled or simmered to kill E. coli? Um, is crock potting six to eight hours on a high, on a high good solution? Okay. Uh, well, the, when you're looking at, um, bacterial uh, contamination. Um, usually when you are cooking uh, the food, and if you cook uh, crock potted uh, on high for six to eight hours, I think it'll kill just about everything. Um, so I, I, I can pretty much say that, that that's good. What you're looking at with sprouts is that those are fresh. Those are fresh sprouts, and so they're grown. They're not cooked, so uh, I wouldn't have any issues as far as um, as far as your your cooking. Um, but if if the sprouts um, and there have been uh, issues with uh, contamination with sprouts, at least commercially, uh, I'm not sure as far as uh, the, the the fresh sprouts. Um, if, if you think that there is a, a connection, then uh, I'm always one <clears throat> to think about this is like toxicity. It's like um, don't feed avocados to your birds, any part of the avocados, because it's toxic. And then I have somebody say, well, Dr. Tully, guess what? I've been feeding guacamole, fresh guacamole to my parrot for years. And, uh, you know, it's not like this is the only thing, but as a treat or something. And my thoughts are, is if you think that there is a possibility of either a toxicity or a possible exposure to a bacteria, then there are too many other things that you can do, too many other uh, foods that you can give so you don't risk that. So if there is the possibility, like you say, well, the sprouts, then, you know, do something else, do something else. And, and there are so many different options on that. And then, um, but I think as far as your cooking goes, you know, you're in good shape with that. Okay. Okay. Um, and I have a question from Jessica. She asks, can you explain what, what might cause, what, can you explain what might be causing 
a tail ticking in my parakeet. Tail ticking. Ticking? Yeah. Like, like uh, T I. T I C K I N G, like ticking. Yeah. The, the, I wonder if that's like tail bobbing, where, where the, the tail, uh, when the bird is um, breathing, uh, that the tail moves down like this. And this is every breath. And so every time you see the animal, you know, the bird breathe, the tail, tail will go down like that. That usually, that usually indicates some form of uh, respiratory compromise. What that, what that means is like a bird uh, doesn't have a diaphragm. They do not have a diaphragm. Uh, they have uh, the lungs, so it goes from the trachea to the lungs, and then you have the air sacs. And the, uh, the air sacs are all within the, the body uh, that's not taken up by um, very important organs like the liver, the heart, everything. And so what happens is that the birds don't have a diaphragm, so they, <clears throat> when they breathe, they have to use their abdominal muscles and the muscles uh, with their, their uh, between the ribs, the intercostal muscles. And so normally, if there is not any type of compromise to the respiratory system, the tail is just like this. But if there is fluid, if there are um, issues with, say, um, uh, uh, say like fungal lesions or any type of maybe um, infection within the, the, the lungs or there's a, uh, a tissue mass, um, it's like uh, cancer or if there's an egg <laughs> that okay. is big in there. Then, then every time that bird needs to use a lot more muscle when it's breathing, and so since it's needing to use its its abdominal muscles and its muscles between its 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 ribs, you'll see its tail go like that. Now, that's you know there can be behavior issues that 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 may cause that um, if the bird is stressed or something, but usually. If you see this every time the bird breathes, then usually that means that there is some type of a, um, like I said, some kind of a compromise in the respiratory system. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so I have a question from Brenda, and she asked, after a 12-year-old Pionis, his previous owner fed him cheese, lots of cheese. How bad is cheese? Does he need a cholesterol check? <laughs> so your head down. That's <laughs> no, uh, you know, uh, cheese is good. Uh, I mean, I like cheese, uh, but as far as as birds, there's um, uh, you know you're not having any lactose in, in cheese. It's a it's a it's a it's a milk byproduct. So what you uh, cheese uh, is not a um, a uh, uh, a problem uh, fed at a uh, what I would consider a regulated uh, amount in, 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 in small amounts to diversify the diet. Obviously, this is again, we talked about dietary diversification last time, but this is uh, again a different type of uh, uh, food item that would fall into that dietary diversification. Uh, and, and to do it on a, uh, <clears throat> what I would say, a kind of a regulated basis uh, in, in, in incorporating it with other, other foods. So cheese as it is, uh, I, I have no problem personally feeding that to birds uh, and at a, at a regulated amounts, uh, not as a major part of the diet. Um, but as far as any type of ill health effects, um, there shouldn't be uh, if it's, it's fed uh, in that manner. So okay. no cholesterol tests. 
that may be just calorie check. Keep it. Keep, keep yeah, calories. that 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 may be a little bitty pionis, you know, that's uh, you know has a very good body condition score. We'll say that. <laughs> you know. All right. Um, I have a question from Tina. Uh, well, first she says, "Thank you for this opportunity." So thank you. Um, we have a three-year-old cockatiel that seems to have occasional seizures for unknown reasons, and now has a bit of drop foot, where he limps on it, can sit and land on it, but prefers to just rest with it closed. He is not in any pain with it that we know of. What can we do with physical therapy maneuvers to help him regain better use of that foot? Interestingly, after a seizure, he totally forgets all of the songs he typically whistles, and then weeks later they return. What can we do to help him? A seizure, um, unknown seizure activity with some type of a uh, neuropathy in the, uh, the leg um, may or may not be uh, correlated. Uh, if he had this uh, seizure activity um, for uh, some time, uh, that it's possible that he may have injured himself uh, while, while doing this. I, I think that what you're what you're looking at are, are possibly two different things uh they could be uh, correlated but you the the one i guess what i would be looking at on something like this is to try to figure out why why the bird has these these seizure like activity um now uh, there are um, anti-seizure medications. I can tell you that uh, uh, why, why would a bird have seizures? Uh, and, and you think about it, we're talking medicine here. So it's sometimes not any different than what if, if a human had seizures. Why does a human have seizures? Well, uh, is it a, a brain tumor? Well, it could be in a bird. Is it uh, from an accident where the bird uh, hit itself on the on the, the head somehow or it, it flew into uh, a wall or you know in it and in, in to you it looked very well you know the bird flew into a wall but he got up and he did okay but to the little head and the brain in there there could have been an injury that was just enough at the right spot in the brain that caused that that to be a, a continued event and uh, also, if there was some delayed um, neurologic uh, effect of that, uh, the, which we call pathology that's associated with the nerve, then, then you may have the leg issue. Then that would all be correlated. Uh, on a young bird, the likelihood of this being um, a, a, a tumor is, is, is low. Uh, that it would have been some unsuspected trauma, you, you know, where it would have flown into something. It doesn't take much and, and it, to, for that to occur. And then also what you look at, uh, what we have had in, in birds, are strokes, where birds actually have had strokes. These are usually older birds um, where they uh, would have... And, and an issue where you have like uh, paralysis, but you may not have just paralysis, but it, it may show up as some type of a seizure activity. Um, and, and so this is, this is something. So there, are, you know, there's a wide range, but if, if you're looking at this, um, you know, for the seizure, you can look at say, you know, you can get it and see if the blood blood work, you can get a workup on it and see if there's any abnormality that may explain it. Uh, if you have low calcium in the bird, is this a female bird that's laying eggs uh, quite a bit? If it is a female bird that's laying eggs, it may be low in calcium and that would, a hypocalcemia would lead to uh, seizure activity also. Um, so, um, and, and, and that is, and, and then you look to see what may be causing the seizure activity and identify it to either treat it 
you know, give it calcium supplement. If it's laying eggs and cockatiels have been known to lay millions of eggs, one bird, millions of eggs within a year. I don't know how they do it, but they do. And, uh, and, and so give it a calcium source to prevent the seizure activity. Now, if the, 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 uh, if it's say, well, we looked at everything and we can't figure out why there's seizure activity. Um, and then we call that idiopathic um, uh, seizure uh, activity, which means we don't know why, why the seizure activity is there, but there's anti-seizure medication that would help these type of birds um, and that we have given to, to birds. And that's something that some of the research that that's been, we've done and been involved with uh, and other veterinarians to develop some of this seizure medication for birds uh, in cases like this and birds with strokes um, that really reduce the incidence of the seizures uh, activity. Now, <clears throat> with the leg, uh, there are, if it's related to it or not, but if there is an injury to the leg and you have neurologic um, injury to the leg or neuropathy that's the, the leg, you want to see, first of all, is, is the leg broken or is it not? You know, you may have a fracture in that leg, and that may explain why the bird's not using it. Um, and so you need to, and, and, and not all the time is the leg going to be like, you know, just limp and you say, oh, well, that's obviously because the legs over here that it's a fracture. It's not always that way. So you need to, you know, uh, radiograph that leg and see if it's fractured and if it's, uh, it may show some injury to the joint. And, and that, that may, may be an indication that that needs to be treated. Um, and then, so there are a number of different treatment options that you look at. Um, it seems like a simple question, seizure activity, leg, what do you do? <laughs> but at the same time, I, wanna, I want you, to, you know, for you to know that when something like this comes in, that's what I'm looking at, or that's what the, the, the doctor's looking at. It's, you know, it's not like, well, this is a seizure. This is what we do. This is, you know, we have to find out what's the underlying cause so we can target treat it. And if you target treat something, then there's a more likely, there's, there's a better likelihood of that being a successful treatment as opposed to, well, let's try this and let's try that. And let's try that. It may be this with that. And if we do that, then it's frustrating for everybody. Uh, in most cases, the chance of getting that dart and hitting it right in the bullseye with your eyes closed and your back turned, yeah. you know, it's, you, you, it's possible, but not probable. And is there a way that they asked uh, for any kind of physical therapy, if it was, say, not broken, but... Well, yeah, you know, physical therapy, physical therapy like you yeah and in, in, in that physical therapy it, 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 it goes into this uh, Laura um, when you have a like we have splay legs in birds where the birds legs are apart and have to try to get them back to where they have a good quality of life it's it's one of the issues when you have uh, in injury or a presentation like this, what the first thing you have to think about is um, it's not going to be perfect. Don't expect perfection. And that we have to know, and that's where knowing what the, um, the cause is, is going to, or the underlying cause, the reason that we have this, is going to give uh, us a, a better chance of saying, well, we need to have this particular therapy because we have the best chance of that. Um, and, and so physical therapy is, it will work, but it's, it's, it's to try to enhance the quality of life for that patient. That's just like if you have uh, a, a person has a bad hip, Okay, you can do physical therapy on the hip, 
but if 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 this isn't there yeah you only could do so much until you get a hip replacement <laughs> and so so physical therapy is effective it's effective to a certain point uh in many cases and on top of that we have used uh, acupuncture, and uh, we do that, we call it integrative medicine, integrating Western and Eastern medicine together. And on cases like this, acupuncture, in when we have determined that that is where we're at, and this is what the case is and what the underlying cause is, acupuncture also is an option. Um, but acupuncture is not going to help a leg that is an old fracture that is healed wrong, that is malaligned and displaced. So, you know, that's why we look at what the, you know, if we can determine, say, this is what it is. If there's nothing there and it may be some type of neurologic issue and we can't see anything else, well, maybe acupuncture can help. And there's also some other therapeutic drugs that we don't know how much effect they are in birds, but um, gabapentin is one of them um, that may have some uh, neurologic effect, uh, but in a positive manner. Interesting, interesting. Um, acupuncture, did not think of that. Um, so uh, Nick asks, uh, what is a safe temperature range for an African gray timna? The safe temperature range is um, whatever your, uh, your, 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 that's a good question too, um, because uh, whatever your comfort zone is within the house, that's a safe temperature range. It's one of those, and why I say it's a good question is because uh, in most people who have birds for a period of time realize this, but birds, uh, for the most part are uh, very adaptable. Uh, and, and I don't hear this as much as, as far as the drafts and things like that. And um, the birds can tolerate cold very well. Uh, they can tolerate cool very well. Uh, they, uh, especially in a cold, they can tolerate if they are transitioned. If they, I can tell you in January, even in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, which bird is, oh, you keep this bird outside, and oh, you keep this bird inside, because that outside bird has a lot more down feathers, and it could be the same, you know, it could be the same blue and gold macaw. Uh, I mean, the same uh, species of bird. Um, but you'll have much more down feathers because it's, it's been acclimatized over the fall with it, and, and as it get cooler, 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 and so, uh, basically can withstand, uh, you know, if it's protected from the elements, you know, 40, 30 degree, 30, upper 30s, you know, and, and so that's, that's in, in general with the birds, just like you see, see the wild birds out there. What birds can't stand is heat. They cannot dissipate heat. And so if you have a bird's body temperature in the you know, 100, 102, 103 range, something like that, if it gets like 105, it's dead. Wow. They'll die like that. They cannot dissipate heat. And so that's kind of interesting, like all my life, you know, no, birds don't like drafts or cold. I never heard anything about heat. But I can tell you, you put a budgie in a, in a car and you keep it out there in the summer and it's, it's in the 90s and you can go in and, 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 and you say, I'm going to be right back out. It'll be dead by the time you get back in, out, out in the car. Um, if it, uh, it, it's, it doesn't take, it's very quick. And so the one thing when you're talking about a temperature with birds, oh, they can withstand and they adapt because your, your house is generally a few degrees more warmer in the summer than it is in the winter. It's a little cooler, but the birds can, can usually adapt you know, well with that. You just don't want to keep, uh, you don't want to expose birds to 
high temperatures. And that, that means in the cage outside in the summer, uh, in the sun, um, and, uh, and, and, and so you really want to be, be careful about that. Yeah. What would, uh, Dr. Tully, what would be some, what would be some obvious signs of heat stroke in a bird? And what could you do if you see your birds suffering like a heat stroke? Well, um, the, if, if, if that's the, they, they die so quickly, Laura, in that type of situation that by the time that you notice it, they're, they're pretty much dead. If, if they, they aren't, then of course they would usually be on the bottom of the cage, um, and, 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 uh, with the, the head down uh, in that situation. They wouldn't have their feathers fluffed, of course, in that type of situation, but it would be a critical, and they would be panting probably. Um, I had a situation where uh, it was, it was uh, two, two uh, you know, I tell the story, it was two, two physicians, and, and uh, they had just graduated medical school, and they were, coming through Baton Rouge and they had uh, a van. Uh, it was maybe a U-Haul and they had a blue and gold macaw in it. And so um, had a had a call and um, and they had just, like I said, graduated medical school and they were on their way to where they were, they were going to practice. And they had stopped in at a hotel and they kept their blue and gold macaw in the cab of the truck and it was like july and this was they they drove in late so this was they had it and they um it was it was uh they probably got in at two in the morning so naturally they were tired and they slept and so by the time they got out to their truck at like 10 a.m one of the signs that you'll see is panting where we're talking about tail bobbing. Well, we're, you would see that. And also what happened was that <clears throat> the bird was panting so much that it's, um, uh, it had a, a rupture in the muscle probably uh, abdominal muscle or in, in air got under the skin. And that's what they were calling about because it was struggling so hard to breathe to get that heat off of it. So um, the, the physicians uh, were, were quick to tell me that they had already made a diagnosis on it. And it was, um, it was a diaphragmatic hernia. And I had, uh, I had to inform the newly graduated physicians that, and I had to thank them for the diagnosis, but unfortunately that wasn't it because birds don't have a diaphragm and that it was uh, subcutaneous emphysema due to the air sac. Um, but that's just a story to show you say, well, what's, what kind of clinical signs um, I, well, one is death, especially if, if you have more than one bird in that type of situation. Uh, and then, uh, on the bottom of the cage, breathing heavily, because like I said, they can't dissipate heat. They have a high body temperature. And, uh, so that would be it. And, uh, or the more, more, uh, common clinical signs. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, Cece had a follow-up question to the cheese question. Um, when you say cheese could be fed in regulated amounts, what does that mean? I was informed by a vet, no animal products, and he said no cheese and showed me a giant mass of cheese he removed from a cockatoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, too much of anything is not good, even brownies, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have, uh, if you want to regulate the cheese, um, intake, uh, there are new cheese Nutriberries by Lefebvre that I would recommend 
so therefore you don't have to worry about how much cheese, but uh, you don't want to feed them a block of cheese. Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, but I know too many people and uh, have fed, fed cheese. Uh, and, and, and when I'm saying uh, a small amount, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, a half inch, half inch cube uh, of cheese, uh, something like uh, maybe two, two times, two to three times a week. Or like I said, if you say, well, I, I'm concerned and, and worried about it. There's too many other things to feed. And then, like I said, you can always feed the cheese Nutriberries. And then there you get the cheese and you don't have to worry about anything there. All right. Um, Joanna asks, what do you think about concrete purchase? What do I think about concrete purchase? Well, my, my, uh, personal uh, thoughts are, and that's what she's asking for, so I'm going to oblige, uh, is that uh, the concrete purchase, uh, terracotta purchase, uh, sandpaper purchase, they have always been <clears throat> promoted as a means to reduce the, the points, keep the, keep the talons if you will, the claws blunted so they don't become like little eaglets, okay? Now, what I always, I always say is that when you look at the bird's foot uh, on, that, on that perch, it's perching on that perch. What's the surface area, the most surface area on that perch? And how much is actually, are the claws touching that perch? And sometimes not much. And so what you're doing is like, you're saying, well, how does it feel to walk on a, um, a rough, you know, gravelly surface barefoot? Yeah. Do you like that? Well, that's what a, a concrete perch is. Now, you know, does it does it help? Um, there are people that say it will uh, help. I uh, I am one to more promote um, natural wood perches um, uh, that are a varying of a varying diameter. Uh, when you can, you know, you have the manzanita, you can get the manzanita perches. Uh, hardwood perches that uh, you clean. You can clean. Uh, uh, make sure you do that if you go hard. I, I have a maple tree in my yard, and I'll get them the the uh, <clears throat> for uh, my my parrot and and scrub that. And 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 they are 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 good. Um, as far as you know, if you are believe, like, hey, I think that those that. that that uh, concrete perch is, is good, or the terracotta perch, or the, the sandpaper, uh, then if you, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's not the only perch I have in there. And so it, yeah, it, it's not going to kill the bird. Um, I haven't really seen, um, uh, I know that depending it, it is, if that's the only perch or the bird uses it, uh, it, it has um, kind of eroded some of the, the, uh, the plantar surface. Um, like I said, it, it hasn't killed the bird. Uh, I think that the, if you go with the natural wood, perch, or natural wood perches that have varying diameter, that it's more comfortable for the bird. It, it, uh, that would be my thoughts. It's exercising the bird. It's more natural for the bird. And that I think that it also provides, if the bird, some birds' claws will grow and get pointed, where mm -hmm. there's some that they just stay, you know, a certain length and and not, and and it's just individual how that works. But um, if you if you are like a firm believer, well. I, that concrete perch, I don't care what Dr. Tully says, then 
I would make sure you have other purchase to, to, to provide in there. But um, I, I think that if you have the natural wood purchase, that that's going to provide as much as a, a concrete perch and also at the same time, be more comfortable for the bird to sit on. But that, that kind of opened up a whole area on perch information. So that was a great question. I, I liked it. I liked it. We still hold webinar devoted uh, <laughs> foot health and perching and all that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I have a question um, from Daniela. She asked, what tests do you recommend during the annual exam for a seemingly healthy bird? What tests do I recommend in an annual exam for a seemingly healthy bird? Um, well, I, the, the test that I, I would recommend, well, is one is the, um, the external physical and it's just like what a physician can do to you. Uh, we can look at the bird, we could look in its mouth, uh, the beak, uh, look uh, uh, the feathers and <clears throat> the eyes, the ears, look, look all over the bird, uh, escalt the bird and, and uh, listen to restoration and then the cloaca, your epigeal gland, if they have one, do the complete external physical, and that's what we see. And if everything looks normal, then we don't see any external abnormalities. Can't see inside the bird. Now, for an annual physical, um, which I, I think is, is extremely beneficial uh, for birds, uh, in particular, um, is the is the the uh, the only test if there's no evidence of any other external like ocular discharge. We look at the all the eyes or the nasal discharge. Everything looks good. Healthy bird uh, in looking externally. The only test that I recommend. I highly recommend, and I would say is arguably the most important diagnostic test that we can, we can actually um, provide is the complete blood count. Um, and that's, that doesn't include the, the chemistry panel on this. Uh, if the bird's never had a chemistry panel, then the first time it's good to get a, a baseline and check that out. But if there's, the bird looks, healthy, then the CBC is the only test that I would say has to be done. If it, you know, if you don't get the CBC, then there's no way to know what's going on inside that bird because it's so many parameters, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, how all of those blood cells are, are, uh, in, in the, uh, the different white blood cells, and you can look at so much that externally, the bird can look good, you know? It can look great, but it could still have, like the hyacinth will call that PCV of 12, which should be 50. Wow. It could be the African gray with aspergillosis that looks good, that has a white blood cell count of 75,000 and 15 is normal. Yeah. Wouldn't even know that. And then the bird dies three weeks from now. You don't have the CBC. And you say, well, I just took it to Dr. Tully and he said it was healthy. And, you know, well, if we'd have had a CBC, we would have known that the bird was not healthy or the hyacinth macaw didn't have, you know. So those are just two examples that we have, whether it's it, it could be TB, it could be leukemia, it could be something like that that you pick up on a, a, uh, a complete blood count. But if you take a bird in for a phys uh, an examination and you don't get a CBC, that's less than half of the exam. Wow. You know, to me, because all you're saying is like, looks good, looks good to me, you know? Well, you know, it's like you go to a physician, how many times you go to a physician for a physical exam and they go like, you know, look good. See you later. 
you know, probably you're going to get some blood work, blood work, whatever that means. Well, it means getting stuck in the arm and having about three or four tubes. But anybody that gets a physical exam, a real physical exam, they're looking inside. And so you have to look inside to know what's actually going on. We're not talking radiographs. We're not, now, if you see anything that's abnormal or that you need to do more prog, but usually if you're talking just about a physical exam, oh, doc, everything looked good, eating well, stool's normal, you know, you know just same old, you know, good little bird that's always been, then the CBC is something that has to be, you know, that I'm, I, you know, and hey, in, in the end, the owner makes the decision. But if you make a decision not to have the CBC, well, it's your decision. But uh, that to me, if you do not have that complete blood count, that's less than half of the, the exam uh, wow. because you're not seeing what's going on inside. And with birds, I have a question. Um, when we go in for blood work, oftentimes they tell us to, with a fasting blood draw, so to fast before we go in. Is there anything like that with, in concern with birds, like when you get their blood drawn, what time of day, or is there any prep work that? No, usually for the, the routine CBC, there isn't. Uh, if it was be some type of a special, I guess it was special diagnostic test that would require that, um, whether it would be some type of a glucose level or what have you. And I can't um, think of a, a maybe a, a, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, but um, there may be, but for the routine, it's, it's not going to be, um, even, even for, uh, we look for liver values, um, and, and so we look at bile acid uh, for liver function uh, in birds. It's, it's somewhat difficult uh, to try to determine what the liver health is uh, through uh, blood uh, chemistry analysis because there can be a lot of uh, interrelated uh, effects by other uh, enzymes. So, so uh, but we'll do, and sometimes with the bile acid, uh, they will, they will say, well, it should be fasted. Um, but for the most part, we don't even do that with birds, but that may be something that somebody would re require. But for the complete blood count, we don't. Okay. I was just curious because yeah. I know that when we go in, we have to sometimes do that. Um, so Lisa asks, uh, going back to the concrete perches, uh, do you think that concrete perches help with beak grooming? Uh, I, you know, in general, I would say no, um, and uh, and it's 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 individual uh, on on the birds. Uh, birds will rub their beak. You'll see birds almost like they're sharpening the beak uh, on a on a perch. They'll they'll do that from time to time, and some more than others. But as far as as the 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 beak uh, is concerned. The, I don't think the concrete perches um, do anything as far as as um, keeping the beak short in in a normal uh, uh, length uh, or or smooth. Okay, uh, I think that that's that's individual. I think that some birds will uh smooth the a little bit by just rubbing their beak but i don't i don't uh i it's not i'd have to somebody would have to tell me that the birds know that they're they need to do that to beak groom I, I haven't heard that it may be possible um but uh i don't see them do it enough that it would would have an effect of smoothing the beak out and you have some normal irregularities. And I think that it's just normal scaling uh, 
that is sloughing off the side of the beak. The, the beak links, the, the main, I guess, reason that the beak is, remains the, the same, the, the, the normal length is occlusion, is the normal occlusive surface. Now there may be an abnormal, um, uh, abnormal positioning of the beak due to trauma or due to some type of a disease condition, uh, or there may be uh, there may be some type of a uh, an internal disease condition that causes the beak. It doesn't. It looks like the beak's straight, but on this eclectus, the beak goes all the way down to the chest, and we have to trim it. Uh, why is that occurring? There's been speculation that the liver uh, disease is involved, but um, but as far as the concrete perches, I think that when you're looking at birds, the normal occlusive surface of the bird's beak it keeps it at the at the proper length. They may help remove some of the the cells that are on the or the side of the beak that are growing by by going back and forth. Um, but uh, but that's just just helping that. So there there may be some effect on the on the side of the beak, but on the 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 tip of the beak not. And and that's just like as we know, like mineral blocks and the and the cuddle bones are calcium sources. They're not beak sharpeners or um, they don't do anything as far as uh, helping with the the beak um, I guess structure. Okay, so looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so Diane asks, do you also perform gram stain during an annual physical? Uh, we, um, I would say no, uh, we used to. Um, and and I, uh, in, in one of the, the what a gram stain does is a, it is a fecal gram stain. I believe that's what she's talking about. And it, it kind of gives you an overview of the, uh, the general GI flora. Um, what, uh, and, and so I can't, um, uh, again, that's just something that we don't do, but uh, it does kind of help to see if, if there is any uh, abnormal bacteria that may uh, be present that could cause disease uh, if the bird was stressed or immunocompromised. Uh, I guess my thoughts is, as we've gone through, uh, if the bird is normal, uh, is, has normal stool, normal appetite, um, otherwise, uh, is uh, no abnormal signs as far, as far as the GI tract is concerned. Um, I'm not um, doing the uh, the fecal gram stain. If there if there's any, and of course it's different. And and so that's what she asked. What do I do on a, on a normal uh, annual health check? And so I'm going to leave it at that. No, we don't do it at this time. Okay, actually, it looks is that's probably our last question for today. Um, looking at the time frame, um, but I do have good news. It looks like we're going to be doing this with you um, the last Friday of the month, right? These uh, Q and A webinars, Dr. Well, well, I think that that's uh, what um, the Lefebvre and Brenda have uh, have talked about. And uh, like I said, I love having you as the the moderator. You, you keep us all in line. And, uh, and, and some great questions. I, I mean, uh, fantastic. And, uh, and, and you can see how it, how it leads to, to other uh, areas uh, within the same, same uh, question. Uh, but it, it, it kind of is a little bit more complex than just sometimes just answering the question. But I think that's what makes it fun and that's how we, we learn. And uh, as you can see, the, there's not always one one way to do something and and that uh even if it's not 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 perfect and you really like the concrete perch say uh just make sure you have other perches in there you know i'm not sometimes i'm not a one or you know you know 
my way or the highway. I don't, I like to, you know, you know, a little variety. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tully, for joining us again today. Um, really appreciate it. Those are, that's some great insight that I'm sure people um, appreciate. So thank you very much. Um, and just to our viewers to let you know that we are back next Friday uh, with another webinar. And we have a, uh, our guest is going to be Dr. Heather Barron. Um, she's going to be talking about what to do when you find a baby bird. And she's also going to give us some tips um, on why to keep wild birds away from your pet birds. Uh, I'm, so you, uh, that's a good thing. An interesting topic we'll be covering next Friday. We'll be, cover, we'll be covering uh, wild birds and, and also um, keeping your birds safe from wild birds. So um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, Till next time, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and all the best to you and your flock. Ah, thank you, Lauren. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh-huh.